This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Funny thing about watching television, people watch it in different sorts of ways. People are on it in different sorts of ways too. You know, a few years ago I'm watching the news on the telly in Italy. And there's a reporter and he's standing outside his small church with a microphone because a painting's just been ripped off from inside the church. Somebody's nicked a Titian painting. Now I'm looking at that television and I'm thinking, that's sad. That's a great little painting. It was in that church. If they ever get it back, We'll have to go in a museum and it will be with a dozen other titians in a row, like a catalogue, like a bloody refugee that's lost its place in the world. And that's sad. You can't keep paintings in churches anymore. Now I'm thinking that looking at the telly. Meanwhile, on the film, the camera's moving off the reporter onto a group of the village women. And they're all standing there glaring at the camera. They look at the camera and honestly the tears were rolling down their face. They looked at the camera and they said, she was our virgin. They've taken our virgin. What have they done? I suddenly thought, my God, that's a strange attitude. I mean, for me, it's a painting. It's a sad thing. It's a sort of aesthetic thing. This painting's been stolen. That's a great shame, you know. But for these people, that was a painting they've been baptised and buried under for hundreds of years. The beauty in the painting was the beauty of their virgin. Now, the difference between them and me is the difference, you might say, between a profane attitude and a sacred attitude. I have a profane attitude. I'm looking at the Virgin and thinking she's a beautiful painting. They're looking at a beautiful painting and thinking she is the Virgin. Now that difference in looking and seeing is what's changed the Bible. The story of the Bible over the last hundred years is really how it's gone from being a sacred object to a profane one. How it's gone from having golden covers on it to being a paperback. This change was a part of the biggest change the West has ever seen, from a sacred to a profane world. It changed the way that man looked at the universe, the way he looked at God and the order of his society. Like most avalanches, it's difficult to see quite how it started. For me, though, the moment was in the 14th century on a day in April, when that most gentle man, the poet Petrarch, climbed a mountain in the south of France. On the appointed day, we left the house and by evening reached Malocène, which lies at the foot of the mountain on the north side. We rested there a day and finally this morning made the ascent with no one except two servants. And it is a most difficult task indeed, for the mountain is a very steep and almost inaccessible mass of rocky terrain. But as a poet once put it well, remorseless labor conquers all. Petra climbed Mount Ventoux in 1336, and he was 32 years old. He's a very stylish young man. His father had died and left him a bit of a family fortune. He was already a poet, writing verses to the great love of his life, the enigmatic Laura. 
Now, when you read his verses, you think he was more in love with Petrarch and poetry than any woman. Anyway, he liked good food, banquets, companionship of friends, and the countryside, which he spent most of his life. But when he came up here, certainly he already had the beginnings of the international reputation, really. You could say, in fact, that he was really on the threshold of his, his own life, his own experience. The world was really at his feet. At first, because I was not accustomed to the quality of the air and the effect of the wide expanse of views spread out before me, I stood there like a dazed person. I could see the clouds under our feet, and the tales I had read of Athos and Olympus seemed less incredible. Petrarch says that when he got to the top of Mount Ventoux, he whipped a copy of St. Augustine's Confessions out of his pocket, a copy he always carried with him everywhere, and read that God was not to be found at the top of mountains, but in men's hearts. Actually, first of all, he talks about its sweet and sonorous words. Consider his journey. It started off because he'd read a classical text about Alexander the Great going to the top of a mountain, and he felt he wanted to do the same. It finished with him rushing back to his little village from where he started and writing a great long letter about this wonderful trip up a mountain. The journey was as revolutionary for Europe as a missionary turning up in an Amazonian tribe would be for the tribe itself. It's funny how books, you think, might have made that. What they've done for him, of course, is removed him from experience, from the ordinary experience of daily life. For most people, after all, mountains were dangerous places. There was nothing up there. The shepherd might come up to look for his lost sheep. A forester might look down to see where he's got more trees to cut. A general might come up here to marshal an army, something like that. That was experience. But Petrarch's imagination and his energy had taken these old texts and projected him up the mountain. And it actually created a new sort of consciousness, a new self-awareness. Five or six hundred years later, of course, that detachment from the real world, which is now built inside of people, creates a large part of what we call the sort of loneliness of modern man. For his own society, over the next few hundred years, Petrarch's new vision of the world was totally revolutionary, both for society and for the Bible. Petrarch's world, of course, was the Gothic world. Even from the top of Mount Ventoux, it was the only world he could have seen, the only world he knew. This was a world with a precise order, a divine order. All men, from kings to peasants, lived and died inside precise circles of influence and status. And this was all part of a divine order made by God and established during the seven days of creation. What kept all this in place, of course, was the ultimate, ultimate deterrent, the last judgment, God's trial of men that will be conducted, so the book of Revelation says, in the world's last days. With the sweep of his hand, he sends the damned to hell. Being good in Gothic society was rather different from being good today. God sent people like wicked priests and princes to hell, not simply because they were sinners, but because their sins muddled and attacked his divine order. Later on, of course, all these torments were recreated on Earth. The fire, the ovens, the disemboweling, the whole lot as men set out to police the divine order for themselves. In Petrarch's day, 
this was still an unnameable terror that has stayed a part of the European vision ever since. Petrarch's place, in his divine order, in the circles of influence in the medieval world, was that a poet and a scholar. Above all, he loved books. He called his library, which was the first private library in Europe, his daughter. He wanted to give it to one Italian town intact when he died. For the people of the town, it would have been the first public library in Europe. Unfortunately, the books were sold off one by one. Now they're all over the world. The Vatican has just these two of them. When you open them, you still get a bit of gust of the man himself. See the beautiful, neat columns of a professional scribe. Down the side, you see, as a professional, every column, every paragraph is nicely titled in that dull red. And there, look, in between the dull red, a crabby little scholarly, amateur almost, handwriting, that's the hand of Petrarch himself. There he is. He's still up there, looking at the prose, looking down on the world, thinking, I wonder if that is right, I wonder if that is wrong. I'll make a note about that. That's a new way of looking at books. Now, the other manuscript, that is yet more amazing. It's a very fine example. Medieval bookmaking. Exquisite collection of ancient texts. You can feel the sacredness in the words. The sacredness that really Petrarch was about to attack. You see, he spent most of his life going around monasteries in France and Germany and Italy, looking at medieval manuscripts, trying to track down the classical world because nobody read this stuff anymore. Petrarch was really the first man to examine classical writing in hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, it wasn't just that easy. You didn't just read it. These texts are often written by fairly bored scribes, and sometimes they're a bit wrong, they're garbled, the scribe goes off on a tangent or whatever. But Petrarch's job, he thought, was to sit down and try and retrieve the original text. And here he is working out exactly what the Roman Cicero said. Now, he didn't stop there. When he got the original text, he then tried to find out what the Roman Cicero had been like. And then he sat down and wrote an article on Cicero the man. That was a, a really marvellous thing. He felt friendly with the past. He says one day when a book fell off a shelf in his library and hit his foot, he wondered why his friend Homer, who was the title of the book, was angry with him. He knew these old people. Now, that profound way of looking at books, which is quite new and quite different, in 150 years paid off incredibly. An Englishman called John Collett it did something that Petrarch would have never dared to do. Collett actually took on St Paul. He didn't actually correct the text very much, but he did wonder what sort of a man St. Paul was. And he wrote an essay, not about St. Paul, but Mr. Paul, trying to find out the man behind the writing. So the letters of St. Paul had stopped being sacred and had turned into the letters of a man. It wasn't long, of course, before the whole Bible was open to gaze. And in this way, dear old Petra, a warm, simple man and poet, really had stirred up an incredible explosion of scholarship. For a very long time, few people realized that Petrarch's innocent new vision of the world was anything but a liberation, a rebirth, a renaissance. Mankind, it was said, had regained its ancient heritage, lost its terror of the dark. Only a few wise men saw that the brave new world that they were making would also be a cold and lonely place. The Christendom, which had given men their order and their dignity, would be utterly destroyed. Michelangelo saw it though. His version of a last judgment has the same order, even the same poses as the medieval one. But his God 
is naked. At the same time as his friends were into an amazing celebration of art and optimism, Michelangelo is looking into the abyss at a world with no order. North of the Alps, the brave new world, the new spirit of the Renaissance, was joined to a new nationalism. The princes of cities like Wittenberg in German Saxony now resented the power of the popes in Rome, and they protested against the unquestioned order of the Holy Roman Emperors. Their churches had become a spearhead of a bid for independence. The building that dominates Wittenberg's town square isn't a church, however. It's that great white elephant over there, the town hall. It's amazing to think that that Gothic monster was being built at exactly the same time as St. Peter's in Rome. But don't think that this lot here are backward. This was a very up-and-coming place. That's an enormous town hall for such a small town as Wittenberg. It shows the wealth that was taking place here. You see, those great plagues which had swept northern Europe had gone, and these towns like Wittenberg were getting richer and richer. It was filled with merchants, and with that wealth and the merchants, all the other things that the merchants wanted to buy with their new money. There were good artists here. There were wondrous printers, that real tool of Protestantism that would really cover Europe with its literature. This was a bustling new town. The one end of the high street, in a very splendid castle, was the Duke. Duke Frederick the Wise of Saxony was a very ruthless man, and he saw no reason at all why he should give his money or any of his power to Rome or anybody else for that matter. But the real dominating influence in this town was that man over there. He taught at the Duke's new university. It was the monk, Martin Luther. Martin Luther, it was, who wrote that German Bible. Luther it was, too, that came to stand at the heart of Germany's Reformation. In 1524, when Luther had given up his monk's vows, he married a pretty woman, Katharina von Bora, and they set up house together here, at the end of Wittenberg High Street. front room. That's a stove that used to keep him warm in the Saxon winters. Like the priest of St Mary's, he'd married a nun and they set up their house here, which is in the old Augustinian monastery. All the monks had run away. They brought their family up here and it was a great laughing family, apparently. Luther loved his wife. He was a great friend of the students, too. He used to go down the beer halls. He was a great boozer, a lovely singer. He used to play lots of musical instruments. A great character. But underneath all that, Luther was a pessimist. It was that pessimism that actually allowed him that flash of inspiration, which was the centre of his Protestantism. Luther, you see, at heart, felt the world was a wicked place. When he'd been a monk, he could see no goodness in it. He said he felt crushed by the Ten Commandments. It was impossible for man ever to be blessed. Remember that terrible image of Christ the judge? I mean, it goes from, from medieval times right through to Michelangelo, and there's Christ sitting there on his throne at the last judgment. There's all the people of the world coming through, and he's slicing them in his hand, and the good go one way and the bad go the other. Well, to Luther, there was only badness in the world. There was no goodness. There was nothing to be redeemed. It's a terrible state to be in. What he did, of course, was to go back to the Bible. And he went back to the Bible as a man of the Renaissance. He went back to the Bible as somebody who would read its words to try and fathom their meaning, not just as they're purred out in church every Sunday. So he started looking at those passages which dealt with sin and how you could be redeemed. And he went to the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. The first three chapters of that talk about how inevitable it is that man sins. And then there's a line in that which immediately caught Luther's eye. Everybody knew it. It said, man was redeemed by grace. 
That, of course, was the grace of God. And everybody had always taken that to be the grace was when God's hand came down to divide the wicked and the good, that the grace was in the good. That grace was in the good part. God let them live. But Luther saw that a bit differently. He said, supposing that grace isn't an active gesture of God, suppose it's something passive which God has given the whole human race. God has given the human race the potential for belief. That's God's grace in giving that potential. If you believed you were saved, it was Luther's last hope. It was his straw at which he clutched for his whole life. It was the centre of Protestantism. At that moment, he said, when he realised it, because it happened in a flash in 1515, at that moment he said, I felt reborn as if I'd entered the gates of paradise. It shows Luther hard at work at his desk translating the Bible as the national hero of his work. But why translate the Bible at all? Well, I think that's fairly obvious actually. Look, Luther's whole inspiration came out of that new understanding of a few words of a letter of St. Paul. And it was, it was as if the Bible had now taken the place of the church, the Roman church, and no longer could satisfy him. So it was necessary, of course, to make a new translation of the Bible. Not just one into a new language, German, but one which actually embodied the new insights of Luther. This isn't just translating. This is a new look, a new interpretation, if you like, of the Bible's words. It's amazing. He did it when he was on the run. He did it when he was on the run from Wittenberg because he didn't think that the counts could protect him. And here's these books that came out in hundreds of thousands in his lifetime, because as Luther scurried around, writing bits of the Bible, very worried, sometimes worried about whether he was going to be caught, sometimes, after all, he was a Catholic himself, worried about whether he was doing the right thing, whether the devil was leading him or God. But nonetheless, the Dukes of Wittenberg, Frederick the Wise, backed him, and the printers here published this stuff in cart loads. They not only published Luther's Bibles, they published hundreds and thousands of these pamphlets, letters of Luther, sermons of Luther, justifications of Luther. In these books, you could say, the Germany is defined. Luther had gone out into the streets and the beer halls of Germany to actually find the language and put it into his new Bible. This was a German Bible for Germany, and the people had to understand God's word for the first time. So here, it's not only a country being made, but the Bible being changed absolutely and completely whatever it was before. In Luther's day, even ideas about the very grace of God had direct political consequences down in the castle. You might think that innocent, quiet ideas about the salvation of Martin Luther's soul were a pretty personal affair. But in Europe, in those days, when God and the Bible were at the heart of things, it was a completely political statement. Look. I'll show you what I mean. Here I am in the Duke's castle. Over there is the church where Luther nailed his protests about Catholicism to the door. Luther was especially worried about the papal idea of being able to sell remission from sin. It was a corrupt practice. It had been going on for hundreds of years. Everybody knew it was bad. It scandalized Luther because as a religious man, it promised salvation by money. Luther knew it wouldn't work. Now, the Duke would see all these notices that went on his castle straight away, and he knew this notice was heretical. Now, he'd been put here by God's grace and by the Pope's say-so. So any notice that went up on his church over there, which was heretical, put him in a fix. Either he burnt the guy that did it or told him not to do it, 
or he sided with the guy against the Pope. And that's what the German did. That's what the German princes did. They didn't like the Pope much either. They wanted political freedom. And Martin Luther's ideas about salvation appealed to them and they could work together. And of course, here in Wittenberg, you've got this amazing propaganda machine with pictures of Luther poured out, the national hero. Printing became a big thing. That was all well and fine. Luther was used here as a political agent of the princes. And it's a knife-edge act, isn't it? Luther actually had to write pamphlets against the peasants, confirming these dukes in their palaces and all the rest of it. He actually had to take the place of the Pope in that extent. In other places, of course, Protestants didn't do nearly as well. Most of them were burnt and hounded. The states were Catholic and they wouldn't become Protestant. In Paris, a bookseller who'd had the Bible translated into French was actually burnt at the stake with his own Bibles used as the fire to kill him. That was the fate of most Protestants. Luther was incredibly lucky. He and his friends all died in their beds thanks to the Dukes of Wittenberg. Thomas Carlyle, one of the balmiest of all Victorian historians, once said a very good thing about Western civilization. He said its roots were held in three things, gunpowder, printing, and the Protestant religion. Well, obviously, those last two, printing and Protestantism, really joined hands at Wittenberg, and they'd exploded throughout Europe together. Gunpowder, of course, tripped along behind in the wars that it caused because it did cause wars, it caused terrible commotion all over Europe. People were burnt from the earliest days as heretics. It was a terrible time for Europe. Christendom was coming to an end. And it took the Church of Rome nearly 50 years to get its act together, to actually consider this immense split in Western civilization. And already in that time, of course, thousands and thousands of Protestants had already been burnt as being heretics. But eventually, they convened a council, and there, they looked into the business of the Bible and its translators. They came down, as one might expect, that their Bible, the old Bible, the great Latin Bible of St. Jerome, was the real Bible. That, they said, held the very word of God in it. All other Bibles, all their translators, mothers of heresy. Luther, of course, was safe enough here in his great castle. He was called the Pope of Wittenberg by his enemies. He must have been greatly envied by all these Protestants who came here to see one of the fathers of the Reformation. One of those was an Englishman, William Tyndall. He was a young man, he was on the run, but he wrote some of the finest prose the English language has ever seen. He would also be the greatest translator of the English Bible. We owe a lot to Tyndall. It must have been a very poignant meeting here between the great German and this poor Englishman. Which of you, though he taketh thought therefore, could put one cubit unto his stature? And why care ye then for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They labor not, neither spin. And yet for all that, I say unto you that even Solomon in all his royalty was not arrayed like unto one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass which is today in the field, Tomorrow it shall be cast in the furnace. Those words are Tyndall's. And they go from Tyndall's Bible straight into the King James Bible. And that, you might say, is one of the foundations of modern England, certainly the modern English language. And that, of course, is why Tyndall, the man, is so important. It's not just that the words of Jesus Christ that you know in English the Tyndall's words, that's amazing in itself. It's more than that. It's the tone of this book he made. It's oddness, it's grandeur, it's rhythm. He somehow managed to capture something of England. Something of his very Englishness. Perhaps he even made some of it himself, who knows. And yet this man who did so much for England is actually a very odd Englishman. He lived abroad, he spoke foreign languages most of his life. This man, this writer of perfect prose. He was always on the run. He was a passionate preacher. He liked Martin Luther. Very few people liked Martin Luther in England. They really didn't like him at all. Tyndall followed Martin Luther. So this great Englishman, he's rather an odd Englishman. But that's where the story of the King James Bible begins. 
In 1525, Tyndall was on the run, carrying the first printed sheets of his Bible, the first Bible in English, from one German city to another. Ten years later, he had been betrayed, and after a year in prison at Brussels, he was executed. The last thing Tyndall asked for from his prison was a Hebrew grammar to help him with a new translation of the Old Testament. He was now so famous that the executioners allowed him the dignity of being strangled before they burned him. Lord, open the King of England's eyes, he's supposed to have said as he was being killed. For in England, though there was a great demand for a Bible in English, King Henry VIII would not allow them in his churches. Henry, whose coins were the first to announce the British monarchs are all defenders of the faith, saw very little reason to support the Protestants. They seemed to be questioning the divine right, the God-given right of kings to rule their subjects. Here's one of poor Tyndall's Bibles. Very small, very suitable for smuggling. Printed in Antwerp, this one. Brought into England. The New Testament, diligently corrected and compared with the Greek by William Tyndall. It had an extraordinary history, this book. It actually caused the British government to pass new laws against customs and excise. These were brought in in all sorts of devious and diverse ways. Some were actually burnt at St Paul's in London. I don't think it was exactly the prose style they didn't like. I think it was the things he called the profitable annotations, those little remarks and explanations that were so heavily influenced by Luther. As Luther, of course, his works were also being burnt at exactly that same time in England. And then, of course, he, he translated some words in a way which seemed to sort of level everybody. Priests became seniors. Kings somehow weren't so mighty in Tyndall's eyes, and that didn't please the authorities either. The next part of the English Bible story is really an extraordinary development. It's this great book, Cranmer's Bible, the Bible in English. Henry VIII, who had seen Tyndall being burnt abroad and had done very little to stop it, just two years after his death, saw this magnificent book put into all the churches of England. And this is basically Tyndall's Bible. It's part, really, of that incredibly complicated and bloody history of the Reformation, as Henry VIII slowly leaves the Catholic Church and forms the Church of England. Now, the problem here is that the Catholic Church, the Catholic world, gave the king an incredible quantity of sacredness. And somehow in this new Protestant world, Henry had to retain that. And one of the ways they chose was using the Bible. So here's the king, Henry VIII himself, doing a sort of delicate balancing act. And he's got his hands on the word of God. Two Bibles there. And there's his ministers, his chancellor, Thomas Cromwell, his archbishop, Cranmer. And he's handing them their Bibles, and they're passing them down to the common people right at the bottom. And they're all screaming out, God save the king. Or some of them are shouting out, Vivat Rex, the slightly more educated ones, I suppose. This Bible was so popular in the church that it said that in old St. Paul's, when eight of these coffees were opened on a Sunday, it was full up with people pushing into the church and pushing each other off of the lectern stand so they could read the Bible. It had never been read by the common people before. There was a great well of literacy in England, and yet nobody had a Bible to read. But all that lovely investigation of the Bible had to stop. Protestant Henry died. And his Catholic daughter, Mary, came to the throne. And she started to persecute the Protestants. When Mary died, Elizabeth came to the throne, and she started to persecute the Catholics. Exiles went abroad, just like Tyndale, and both of those groups of exiles produced their Bibles. After Mary and Elizabeth, King James, and King James's great Bible. In a way, the Bible itself is a part of that balancing act that the kings were having to do. It's a sort of a delicate act where majesty lays his hands on the holy word. To the most high and mighty prince, James, by the grace of God, king of Great Britain, France and Ireland. 
As soon as he came to the throne, the Puritans, the hard-line Protestants in England, had hit him with petition upon petition. His great Bible was a part of a deal he'd struck with them to revise the habits of the church and its great book. In fact, it's a triumph for the committee system. More than 40 scholars worked on it. They took all the previous Bibles, revised them, and made that greatest treasure of the English language. 90% of it is Tyndall's, the little books that were first smuggled into England. But now his language was appearing under the royal seal itself. There, right at the front of the Bible, the seal of King James. The kings themselves, however, didn't do quite so well. The royal balancing act between sacredness and an ordinary rulership had failed completely. James's reign has been called by one historian a prelude to a disaster. His son, of course, Charles, went to the scaffold. When the Puritans, those same people who had bargained with James over the content and order of his great Bible, when the Puritans led Charles out onto the scaffold in Whitehall, he shouted at them, remember, the sovereign and his subjects are clean, different things. Charles actually lived in that same age of sacredness as the Bible was conceived. And when his head was chopped off and the executioner picked it up and held it out to the crowd, they said a great groan went through the crowd. It must have been a horrible thing to see, but I think there was something more terrible going on there. What was going on was the death of something sacred, the death of... The death of sacred kingship we stretch back to the pharaohs, perhaps even to the patriarchs themselves. Now, that sacredness is in Tyndall's Bible. It's in James's Bible. It's in the Bible we still use today. That Bible was made in the ancient age of faith. You know, if Petrarch had gone to sleep on top of his mountain for 500 years, like Rip Van Winkle or something, and they'd woken up and come down here, I don't think he'd feel that much out of place. After all, looks like a Gothic cloister, doesn't it? But this isn't 1270 in the south of France. This is 1870 Oxford. And we know better than Petrarch, don't we? Because... When we look at buildings like this, we don't think they're gothic cloisters. We think, uh, what are, what's this then? Is it a swimming bath, a wimpy bar, a theatre, uh, you know, a railway station? What the hell is it? Well, actually, this one is a museum. So that means that all the little rooms off of these cloisters where the monks would have prayed for the soul of the world for eight hours a day are actually filled up with professors. Professors of the natural sciences who are ordering, regulating the world. They're doing just the same job as the monks did in some sort of a way, is that it's giving the rest of us mortals an idea of our place in the world, of our place in society. Which is, after all, what the monks were trying to do, which was to create a human society that was at one in the universe with its God. But these guys, of course, they're not very good at organising a whole cosmos from archangels to peasants. They only do birds and bees these days. This is a rather lonely universe. Petrarch's vision, if you think about it, was a very wide, clear vision, but it was a very lonely one. We've lost the god. Sacredness is somehow dissolved. And perhaps that's why these Gothic cloisters have got such a terrible air of desperation in them. It's a grasping by the architects and the people who use these places for something of that old, firm order of society. In doing it, of course, what they conjure up is a sort of churchy atmosphere. And that's what they've made themselves. They made themselves a church of science. You know, for a museum, this is pretty high church, what with all its vaults and bones and statues and things. The bones in this scientific church are doing exactly 
the same job as the bones of the saints. They're validating scientific theory. In just the same way that the saints' bones and their miraculous power validated the power of God and the order of his universe. And as for all these statues, well, they're the statues of the orderers. If you go and cut the king's head off and the whole world starts to spin, you need a new order in it. And in the scientific world, it's the orderers that become the saints and get the statues. Here at the Oxford Museum, the patron saint is Charles Darwin. This is hallowed ground, the very place where, in the year of our Lord, 1860, the great debate took place. The debate where Darwin's theory of evolution was matched against Adam and Eve and the creator of the universe. Representing God in the Bible, you had Bishop Soapy Sam, as he was called, Wilberforce, the Prince Consul's chaplain, and reviser of the Bible. On the other side, for Darwin, Thomas Huxley, the eminent biologist. We had a great debate here in the lecture theatre, and the Bible and God were seen to be vanquished, and the theory, Darwin's theory, that men was descended from the apes, took over. So the story goes, that's the popular scientific story. What does that give us for a history of the human race? Well, what it did, by booting out the Bible, you managed to boot out Adam and Eve, and that sort of moral development of man that goes on. And you replace it with a sort of mechanical scientific development. So instead of Adam and Eve, you have a bloke in a Land Rover in the desert, marching around with a lot of tribesmen digging up monkey bones. And that, you see, represents man's progress. You start with monkeys. You go through anthropological man, and you end up with Land Rover man. It's a wonderful theory. But Land Rover man needs thousands and thousands of years of civilization behind him. And in the West, one of the seeds and centres of that civilization was the Bible. So where the hell was the Bible in all this? Where else, of course, but in the anthropological department, in the gallery that holds the works of man. Here, you really get the feeling that the splendid Oxford Museum is not so much a tour of the universe, but a trip around the Victorian brain. So they're the headhunters, and here are the Hindus all swarming away in a caseload of little gods all jumping up and down. And somewhere here's Christianity, I suppose. But everything's amazing. I mean, it's this wonderful Victorian jumble. They sent people out all over the earth. They sort of emptied its pockets. And there's all this wonderful skulls and bits of ancient Egypt. And it, actually, these bits of ancient Egypt are rather good bits. Dug up by Flinders Petrie, who was working in Egypt from about 1880. Now, he was really the founder of Middle Eastern archaeology. And he worked in Palestine in the 1880s too. He was slicing through mounds, using the different layers of the cities as a time chart. So, so he, he was, was actually, actually able, able to work out the different ages of the cities in the mound and work out too where ancient Israel was in that mound. And just a few years before Petrie had got there, an American vicar had ridden right through Palestine over three years of work, looking at the rivers and the mountains, asking the people what the old names were. And he'd actually resurrected all the geography of the Bible, too. It's part of this enormous Victorian energy and interest in the world. Primitive records and development in writing. So here it all is for the inquiring mind. Burma, China, India, and the ancient world, the ancient Near East. Hieroglyphics from Egypt, cuneiform from ancient Mesopotamia, and little wax writing tablets from the same villages that the oldest fragments of the Gospels have been found in. You know, in the 19th century, all of this, everything in this case, was deciphered. All the different languages of the ancient world, the whole thoughts, all the thoughts of ancient man were suddenly given to the modern world. And my God, that was the Bible world, and they found the Bible stories in it. It said that Gladstone actually adjourned the English Parliament so that he could go and hear a lecture by a Syrian smith of the British Museum, 
who just deciphered one of these tablets. On it was the story of the flood. Lots of people were beginning to realize that the Bible anciently had swum in a great sea of sacredness and myth the story. But you know, they were still frightened actually to put a Bible in a case like this. The editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica, an eminent Scottish theologian, was actually put on trial for blasphemy about 1880, because he suggested that you could subject the Bible to the same sort of analysis as all the rest of the ancient world's texts were being subjected to. But at the same time, you know, the Bible had sort of died. It had died because people had raised all these damn questions up, I think. Think about it. It's not just Huxley arguing about the creation and saying, that's silly, God couldn't have done this, the Bible's wrong. It's actually those people who are galloping over the Holy Land and digging it up. Because the truth in the Bible has moved from a moral truth and a social truth into the idea that you actually had to go to Palestine and dig something up to prove it. That's how the Bible, I think, was finally killed. And as for the general public, it was swamped. You know, there's this story, there's that story, there's disbelief. One professor says this, one professor says the other. The whole thing sort of dissolved before your eyes. So what's left then? That ancient, sacred, royal Bible has become a book in modern English, a book of moral parables. But a book whose ancient stories still have the power to move us. Practically as soon as the movies were invented, people were filming Bible stories. So as soon as the television started up, the Bible movies flooded onto the telly. I suppose more people have seen the Bible stories on the box than have ever read them in the book. But the book's not done badly either in the great amazing media explosion. In the 1880s, a new sort of printing was developed, very, very fine paper. At that time, they could make an entire Bible for a penny a copy. It was an instant worldwide bestseller and has been ever since. Now, what that's done for the little book is it has really, truly put it into everybody's hands who wants a copy in the whole world. Tyndall's dream, when he went to the state, of somebody, everybody in the world owning a Bible is now true. Now, that means that you ha can have the Word of God, if you so want and so believe, in your hand. You can actually open it up and read the Word of God and understand it, and you're at home. Or, alternatively, you can sit and watch your telly and watch a preacher who has no congregation other than something the other side of the television glass, standing with the old book in his hand, telling you what to believe, and you can then look him up. It's a new sort of religion. It's not the old religion. It's not part of Petrarch's world. When he looked down, he saw a world where people naturally felt sacredness underlying the very earth as well as the book. Now, you have to choose to believe that these words are utterly true in the word of God. You have to be reborn. It's a new sort of Christianity. But you know, whether you've been reborn or whether you're just a regular churchgoer or whether you're like most people in the world today and you don't go to anything, those old Egyptians, those old Mesopotamians, the Israelites and all the rest of the people in this book still in all of our high streets. They're still a part of the world today. The word, the structures, the forms of the Bible has influenced everything in the West. Think of it. Think of Marx, Einstein, Freud, all these people. They see the universe as containing structures, hidden structures which need investigating. There are forces, actions, reactions in them. Just like the old Mesopotamian families, just like the oldest stories in the book of Genesis. Above all, though, there is the Bible's notion of a God that moves with man through time, the belief that things will get better in the future, 
but life's a journey. That sense of destiny, of dissatisfaction, has become the hallmark of the West. So the Bible teaches you, it forms, it shapes, it's left its influence right through our society. The Bible is still here today, whether you believe in it 